are these cars going? Really, really fast. The cars on this track have some incredible acceleration. We're going to be learning about acceleration and how it works and the major role that it plays in physics. Compared to the real thing, this Porsche may not look all that impressive, but it can still accelerate even if it's not as fast as the one we just saw. In physics, we define acceleration as the rate of change of velocity over time. The SI unit for acceleration is meters per second squared. It's a vector quantity, so it has a magnitude and a direction. The formula for finding acceleration goes like this. The acceleration of an object measured in meters per second squared is equal to the final velocity of the object minus the initial velocity of the object, both in meters per second, divided by the time taken in seconds. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about this little Porsche or a real one on a track. The initial velocity of this car as it's standing still is zero meters per second. The driver hits the gas and it starts to accelerate. 1.5 seconds later, the final velocity of the car is 10.5 meters per second. So the acceleration will be equal to 10.5 meters per second minus zero meters per second divided by 1.5 seconds. Hence, our acceleration will be seven meters per second squared. So acceleration is simply a change in the velocity of an object over time. And it doesn't matter if the object is speeding up or slowing down. For example, if your initial velocity and acceleration have the same sign, you're speeding up. Both signs could be positive, in which case you are accelerating in the positive direction. Or both signs could be negative, in which case you are accelerating in the negative direction. If your initial velocity and acceleration have opposite signs, then you're slowing down, or decelerating. Remember from the previous segment that velocity doesn't just have a magnitude, it also has a direction. So when an object is changing direction, even if its velocity has the same magnitude, it's still accelerating. Acceleration doesn't just mean going faster. It can mean slowing down or even going around a corner. Now that we've spent some time on acceleration, let's talk about kinematics. Kinematics is a science of describing the motion of an object. There are a few different ways to work through kinematic problems. In this segment, we're going to use equations. Kinematic equations give us the big picture when we're talking about motion. They show us the relationship between displacement, velocity, acceleration, and time. We can use kinematic equations to solve problems for scenarios that have constant acceleration, when the acceleration isn't changing, instantaneous acceleration, which is the acceleration at a specific given moment in time, and average acceleration, the overall change in velocity over time, over the course of an entire journey. In this physics course, all of our examples will have acceleration that is constant. There are four main kinematic equations, and they can help us navigate most kinematic problems. Each one of the equations has three or more of the variables that we mentioned earlier, displacement, velocity, acceleration, and time. Let's take a look at the equations themselves. The first one states that the final velocity of an object is equal to the initial velocity of an object plus its acceleration multiplied by the time. The second equation says that the displacement of an object is equal to half times the sum of the initial velocity and the final velocity multiplied by the time. The third states that displacement is equal to the initial velocity multiplied by the time plus half times the acceleration multiplied by the times squared. The fourth and last kinematic equation states that the square of the final velocity is equal to the square of the initial velocity plus two times the acceleration multiplied by the displacement. So when we want to solve a kinematic problem, the first thing we want to do is identify all the known variables. Then we pick an equation that allows us to solve for the variable that we don't know. Let's go back to the racetrack for an example. The car is moving along at 70 miles an hour, which is about the same as 30 meters per second. Let's measure the time it takes to get to a complete stop once the brake is applied, bringing the car to a gentle stop. Okay, so exactly two seconds pass between hitting the brakes and the car coming to a complete standstill. Let's use this information to calculate our acceleration as the car was slowing down. The first thing we do is identify all the variables that we know. Our initial velocity was 30 meters per second. 
our final velocity was zero meters per second. The time it took us to stop was two seconds. The unknown we will be solving for is acceleration. Out of the four kinematic equations, this one best matches what we need. It has initial velocity, final velocity, and time, which we have the values for, and it has acceleration, which will be our one unknown variable. Starting with the equation, we can replace the variables with known values. Our final velocity of 0 meters per second equals the initial velocity of 30 meters per second plus a, which is our variable for acceleration, times our time of 2 seconds. We subtract 30 meters per second on both sides to get rid of it on the right, which gives us negative 30 meters per second equals acceleration times 2 seconds. We divide both sides by 2 seconds and find our acceleration to be negative 15 meters per second per second or negative 15 meters per second squared. Because our values for initial velocity and acceleration have opposite signs, we know our car is slowing down. Now, let's do an example where we solve for displacement. In this case, the initial velocity is 20 meters per second, final velocity is 0 meters per second, time is 4 seconds, and our rate of deceleration is negative 5 meters per second squared. What equation can we use to find our displacement? We actually have three choices. They all contain our unknown variable, displacement, and we have enough information to plug into them to solve. So we can use any of the three and we will get the same answer. Let's use the simplest looking one. Displacement equals one half times our initial and final velocities added together, multiplied by the time. Let's plug in the values we know into the equation. Displacement equals one half of 20 meters per second, plus 0 meters per second times 4 seconds. 20 plus 0 is 20 times 1 half, which leaves us with 10 meters per second times 4 seconds. Our seconds and our units cancel out, leaving us with a displacement of 40 meters. Now, what do you think would happen to the stopping displacement if the initial velocity of the car was doubled and our rate of deceleration remained the same? The stopping displacement when the car was going 20 meters per second was 40 meters. The initial velocity of the car is now 40 meters per second, double what it was before. The driver applies the brakes at the same spot as before and decelerates at the same rate as before. Of the four kinematic equations, we can use this one to calculate the stopping distance. Our final velocity is 0 meters per second, our initial velocity is 40 meters per second, and our rate of acceleration is negative 5 meters per second squared. When we work through the equation, we find out that our stopping distance is 160 meters, more than three times what it was before. So, as the initial velocity increased, so did the stopping displacement. This matters when looking at how fast we're going and how far we have to go to stop. Let's move on to how we can use graphs to represent the acceleration of an object. If we have a velocity versus time graph, we can use it to learn about an object's acceleration. In a velocity versus time graph, the time elapsed will be shown on the x-axis, and its velocity shown on the y-axis. This graph shows constant acceleration, which on a velocity versus time graph looks like a straight line. By looking at the slope of the line in a velocity time graph, we can learn about an object's acceleration. It makes sense that this object is moving at a constant acceleration because the slope of the line is not changing. The velocity is increasing by the same amount per unit time. We can calculate the constant acceleration by finding the slope of this line. We can also have graphs that look like this, with a line going up and down. This part indicates I have a velocity that is increasing a constant amount. I am speeding up in the positive direction. This would be me moving at a constant deceleration with my object continuing to move in the positive direction, but with a velocity decreasing in magnitude, slowing down in the positive direction. It doesn't mean that I'm moving back towards the origin. The negative slope just means that I'm slowing down, but I'm still moving in the positive direction since my velocities have a positive value. Remember, the slope of the line on a velocity versus time graph shows the acceleration of the object. In this segment, we talked about what acceleration is and how we can calculate it. We also went over kinematics and the four equations that can help us solve through most problems of motion. We've also looked at how we can deduce the magnitude and direction of acceleration by looking at the slope of the line in a velocity time graph. That's it for this segment of Physics in Motion, and we'll see you next time.
For more practice problems, lab activities, and note-taking guides, check out the Physics in Motion Toolkit.